Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, to go over what this training is going to be is we're going to take turns. Um, so I'm Emma Burke. I'm the political committee and lobbyist registrar at the Ethics Commission. So I'm going to run you through registration and reporting requirements for committees. Um, at the end of my spiel, um, Julie, our commission assistant, uh, will read out any questions that have come in via the chat. So if you do have any questions as I go, please just send them in the chat. And when I am done presenting, uh, Julie will read them out loud and I will answer them. Uh, we'll then take a short break uh, between myself and then the commander to register and come in and do this of the presentation. Um, if you have any issues with seeing or hearing, please also mention that in the chat. Are you able to adjust the audio? It's a bit difficult to hear. Um, we got to notice that it's difficult to hear, so we're just going to take a second. That any yeah, you have an echo, garbled speech. So we're just going to work a second to try to figure that out so you guys can hear me. The person closer to the mic, we can hear fine. It's probably, if you're not using the owl for the mic, then maybe it's coming from your laptop. Obviously, that sounds much better. Okay. Okay. All right, does that sound fine to everyone now? Yes, okay, yes, I will start over. Um, so good morning, everyone. Thanks for dealing with us for those tech issues. So I'm Emma Burke. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm the political committee and lobbyist registrar at the Ethics Commission. Um, I'm gonna run you guys through registration and reporting requirements for PACs and ballot question committees at your municipal level. Um, if you have any questions about the content of my presentation, feel free to put them in the chat box at the end of my presentation. Julia is going to read the questions out loud, um, and then I'm going to answer them to the best of my ability. And if there's anything I feel like I can't answer today, I'll follow up with you later. Um, after I am done, we're going to take a short break, and then the candidate registrars will take over and run you through their requirements. Um, if we notice anything in the chat about audio or video issues, we will pause and get those figured out. Um, so to start with, we're going to go over two different types of committees today. We're going to go over political action committees, referred to as PACs, and we're going to go over ballot question committees, which are referred to as BQCs. Um, if you need a little moniker, I remember PACs for people and ballot question committees for bonds. So uh, PACs are always about candidates. They're about people. They are groups uh, formed to raise funds to influence candidate elections only. Ballot question committees are organized groups where they're trying to raise funds to influence the outcome of some kind of referendum on your municipal ballot. So the committees themselves, most of them, uh, the two together, are very similar in their registration and reporting requirements. So as I go, as I talk about requirements for committees, assume that I'm talking about both PACs and ballot question committees at the same time, and any differences in statute or rule I will point out. So the biggest thing to know about registration is that a group is required to register with you within seven days after they raise a certain, after they raise or spend a certain amount of funds. For PACs, that is $2,500. And for ballot question committees, it's $5,000. So anytime any individual person or group of people or corporation or union or some other organization 
form and raise $2,500 if they're working on candidate elections, raise or spend $5,000 if they're working on a ballot question election, they have to register with you within seven days. That's their timeline. If they go over seven days, then they are in violation. Now, within the registration process, once they register, they also then have to file an initial campaign finance report within seven days of registration, creating a 14 day or two week window in general. So that initial campaign finance report is actually totally part of the registration. A registration for a committee is not considered complete unless you get that initial campaign finance report in. So that initial report will cover January 1st of the year they've registered in up through the date that they registered. It does not cover any time after the date they registered to which the initial report is filed. And that initial report is to disclose to the public any of the any of the financial activity the group has participated in between when they formed and started and when they registered. So again, the threshold for PACs is $2,500 and the threshold for BQCs is $5,000. So that difference does need to be remembered. What is interesting about these two groups is that they are allowed to dabble in each other's territory, if you will, a certain amount of financial activity um, without having to register a second group. And that financial activity amount is $10,000. So any PAC can participate in a ballot question election up to $10,000 worth of financial activity. And the same goes for ballot question committees participating in candidate elections up to $10,000. Um, that is just to allow some flexibility. So groups who you know really have a main concern with either candidates or ballot questions, but have one particular thing they'd like to get interested in in the other area, it doesn't have to immediately register um, and have a whole other filing schedule for a relatively small amount of financial activity. So the registration process, as you know, is done with you. It is done on paper. Um, the initial campaign finance report is also filed on paper with you guys, as all other reports are. Um, as part of a registration for any committee, the treasurer, the principal officer, and any decision makers have to file a separate form with you called the Acknowledgement of Responsibilities form. Uh, that is included in whatever packets we send you for registration purposes. It's just important to make sure that you get that within 10 days of the registration coming in. Um, it is an affirmation statement from the individuals involved with this group so that they're aware of the laws, they'll follow the laws and, and all that good stuff. Um, so that is part of a registration that is different than candidate registrations you'll hear about later on. So once a group is registered with you, that then enters them into a reporting cycle. Um, and for any municipal election, essentially, if there's an election that year, the group has to file reports 11 days before the election and 42 days after. That is the same for both PACs and ballot question committees. All committees also file quarterly reports. This is very different than party committees and candidates. Committees are the only type of group, PACs and ballot question committees are the only types of groups that have quarterly reports. So these are due regardless of financial activity. Once a group is registered and it has not terminated, they're required to file quarterly reports. Those reports are due um, in January, in April, in July, and in October for the previous three months. So the first one covering a year's activity is in April, and it covers January through March. Then you have July, which covers April through June. Then you have October, which covers July through September. And then you have January, which covers October through December. Those are in any years, regardless of whether there is an election or not. If there is an election, again, you have the 11-day pre-election report due and the 42-day post-election report due. If either of those 11 or 42-day reports fall within a 10-day window of when a quarterly report would be filed, the quarterly report does go away. So we're not trying to overly burden people with reporting for very short reporting windows. 
Again, those are reporting schedules that we figure out for you and send to you each year. So it's not something you're having to come up with on your own, uh, but it's just something to be aware of if you're used to seeing four quarterly reports and then some years you see perhaps three. I wanna take a pause for a quick second to see if I have any questions come in about registration. How are we to identify when we need to let a group that they need to register with us? It seems that it might be possible that a group could be spending raising funds without knowing, without us knowing. Who asked that? Um, Ellis Ledoux. Okay, so that's a good question. And really, the burden on a group knowing to register is not on you, it's on them. If they're going to go out there and become financially active and try to influence elections. It's their responsibility to know when they are required to register. Um, obviously, we all know in the real world that's maybe not totally realistic for groups to understand when they're supposed to register. Um, but it's not solely your responsibility. It's a good idea if you know groups are really starting to raise and spend funds to reach out to them if you know who they are and remind them of the registration requirements. Um, but it's not your responsibility to try to follow everyone in your town and see if they're hitting the either the twenty-five or five thousand dollar threshold for registration. Um, you can basically post things on your municipal website. Um, you know, you can try to contact people if you know about it. Um, I'm also currently working on a guidebook strictly for municipal ballot questions, too. Um, I think ballot questions can sometimes be the, the sneakier kind of activity. Um, and so that will be available for both you and the public soon. Um, so that can be sent to your groups who are working or look like they may be hitting a registration requirement. Right. I don't have any other questions about registration. I'm going to get more into reporting. So like I said, you're going to have between four and six reports due, normal reports due every year, depending on whether there is a June or November election. The 11 and 42 day reports are due around the June election or the November election, depending on what's on the ballot, whether you're having a candidate election or whether you're having a municipal referendum election. Um, so those four to six reports do, if they are due by 5 p.m. in your office that day, um, we do have a penalty statute and uh, we have a penalty formula in statute. So if someone does file that report even one day late, uh, there's a potential financial penalty depending on their financial activity. Um, at the end of the day, we do leave it up to the clerk's discretion whether they want to move forward with an, an enforcement process. Uh, we do understand how incredibly busy all of you guys are, and this is just one of the many, many hats you wear. Um, but we have also found it useful to use as a tool to encourage, especially um, if you have repeat offenders, uh, it's at least a good encouragement tool to let people know that there are quote unquote automatic financial penalties for filing reports late. So reports again are due by 5 p.m. Um, we do really want to encourage you if you have people who are not filing on time or who aren't filing at all, um, reach out to me if you need any assistance with that, but it is incredibly important for you to get those reports. And it's also very important for those reports to be posted in a public format um, because the point of the reports is to be disclosure to the public of how their elections are being influenced. Uh, so we do ask that on your uh, municipal website or some other feature that it's they're easily shared so someone from the public can view them. Um, there are also some other reports that may be filed, may be required throughout the year, depending on the committee's financial activity. So there's for both ballot question committees and for PACs, uh, there are reports that may be required called 24 hour reports. Um, these reports are due within the two weeks prior to any election, whether it be June or November. Um, and they are required if a committee accepts a single contribution of $5,000 or more or makes a single expenditure of $1,000 or more. 
They're then required to file with you by 5 p.m. on paper a 24-hour report. Um, understandably, you work business hours. Obviously, some city halls, town halls have even more different hours than your typical eight or nine to five. Um, you should instruct committees based on whatever your town's hours are, how to file those reports on weekends or holidays um, and the way you best see fit, um, whether that's there's some kind of Dropbox they can put them in, um, whether they can fax them, whether they can scan or email them to you. So there's some kind of timestamp involved. It's up to you to determine how you'll accept them as being on time. But again, those reports are required and you'll have the paper forms from us to give to folks to fill those out. I would actually suggest giving some blank copies to committees um, as well as with normal campaign finance reports, I would give them to those once they register so they have them available to them to use whenever they need. Um, so 24 hour reports, I would suggest depending on however you communicate with your committees, um, you know, whether you try to keep them up to date on emails and reminding them for filings, um, certainly remind them before this time period starts and then remind them again right when it does of their reporting requirements to get those in in the two weeks prior to the election. Um, take a quick pause to see if anyone has any questions about 24-hour reports, quarterly reports, initial reports, or the 11 or 42-day reports. I'm going to go into content of those next. Don't see any. Okay. Oh, will you discuss enforcement and penalty fees later? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to. I can discuss it. I'll go over content of the reports first, and then we'll talk about penalties. So reports are required to include essentially every cent of financial activity the committee has participated in during the SAT reporting period. That means every cent raised and every cent spent, um, also including debts and obligations, which can be the thorniest part of reporting and for people to understand how and when to report them. So debts and obligations are essentially when someone has placed an order or made a purchase but hasn't paid for it yet. If they cross a reporting period where they have placed an order but haven't paid for it yet and they get to the end of a reporting period, they have to report that as a debt or obligation on their report. Um, that is mainly because folks could pay for something way later in the election or even after the election, and if they weren't required to report it until they paid for it, you could have a lot of activity going undisclosed until after the election is over, which is obviously something we want to avoid. So that's 24-hour reports in a nutshell, and again, ballot question committees and political action committees have to file those and they have the same requirements for filing those as well as the quarterly reports, the 11 and 42 day reports and initial reports. There is another kind of report that only PACs have to file and those are called independent expenditure reports. Um, so we call these IEs um, just because independent and expenditure reports is a mouthful. Uh, so IEs have different windows of time in which they have to be filed. An independent expenditure itself that has to be on these report is any time any person or committee spends $250 or more on a single expenditure to promote or support to, excuse me, to promote, support, or defeat a candidate that is clearly identified in the communication. So this is, for example, this is your typical Sometimes you see digital ads, sometimes you'll see ads in newspapers, sometimes folks put out lawn signs that no candidate was involved in. Um, the classic example are all those fun, you know, nasty presidential campaign commercials that say at the end, like, not paid for or authorized by any candidate. Those are the type of communications we are talking about just in a, you know, much smaller frame. Um, so we also see direct mail. That's a very common one as well. So it's very easy to spend $250 or more on any of these communications. So there are windows of time in which they have to be filed. To move back from the quickest to the furthest apart from when you have to file, 
similar to the 24 hour reports, there's the two week window before an election where an independent expenditure or IE report has to be filed within one day. And it is called the one day IE report. From you back up even further. And then there's between 60 days and then that window of the two weeks before the election that reports have to be filed within two days. Any time between when an organization creates itself or registers to 60 days before an election, they have one report that is due called the 60 day pre-election IE report. And they can file all of their activity that counts as IEs in that one report due 60 days before the election. So essentially, there are three types of IE reports. Um, there's one that's going to scoop up everything between when they register and 60 days before the election. And then they start going on a uh, basically a rotating cycle where every time they make an expenditure that triggers an IE report, they either have a window of time in which they have to file within two days, and then within two weeks of the election, they have to file within one day. Um, these are also ones that can trip up smaller committees the most. Um, it's easy to lose track of them and all of the kerfuffle before an election. So again, when you send out reminders to your committees, um, I would remind them of these windows of time. I would send them home when they register with blank IE reports to file with you. Um, sometimes IEs can result in thornier, stickier questions. I'm happy to help you walk through any of those as you get them from the folks in your communities so you can give them the best guidance possible. Um, but we do consider independent expenditure reports to be one of the most important ways to disclose to the public what is financially happening in their community because sometimes these are the mailers, communications, ads that can bother people the most. Sometimes they have, you know, the more heated or aggressive language, mainly because it's not a, can a campaign putting it out. It's a group that says they're not and they cannot be involved with any candidate campaign. So uh, working as someone who used to work in the candidate field and now works in the committee field, um, you definitely see content and communications that committees put out that can be um, the type of language that's going to maybe cause some upset feelings, hard feelings in a community. So it's just something to be prepared for and to watch out for once these communications start coming out and that they're properly reported uh, because that's something people are really going to look for is to see who's financing these, who's putting these out. So that's content of reports, yes. There's a question about whether there's a handout will be deadlines on it. Would this be in the municipal guide? Mm -hmm. No, so there is the deadlines will be on, we, we create a filing schedule. There is a committee filing schedule for municipalities that gets sent um, as part of your package with reports, with the blank reports and blank registrations. So these dates and windows will be on that for sure. Uh, so that is overall content of reports. Um, as far as late fees go and penalties go, uh, we won't go over the super specifics here because it's math and no one wants to hear math from a speaking person. Essentially the formula in statute is you take a percentage of the financial activity on the report and you multiply it by the number of days late. So, the longer someone goes without filing, the higher the penalty goes. Um, what this requires from you, which is why it can be harder for you guys to incorporate this into your already crazy schedules, um, is that you have to sit down, do the math, send an official notice to them, and start essentially this process of whether they were going to request a waiver of the penalty, either a complete waiver or a reduction in amount, um, which could therefore wind up coming to our commission um, and then, you know, follow up and kind of chasing on your end. Some penalties can be very small depending on the amount of financial activity. Essentially, anyone who files a no activity report is going to have a zero dollar penalty. They'll have a violation, but there won't be a penalty because zero times anything goes zero. Um, but then sometimes you can have someone have a lot of financial activity and run a report 
and even it being one day late can result in a hefty penalty. Um, any penalties of 25 or less are automatically waived. Uh, that goes into effect on October, in October, I think it's October 25th. Um, that goes into effect right now, it's $10 or less, but starting October 25th, it's $25 or less. Those penalties are automatically waived. Um, anytime someone incurs a violation of filing late, if they file late again, the penalty of the financial activity that is multiplied by the number of days late increases. The two penalty percentages we use are 2%, 4%, and 6%. So you start at 2. If they're late a second time, it goes to 4. If they're late a third or more times, it's 6%. Um, again, we're happy to help guide you anytime you have enforcement issues. Um, you know, we understand that you're, this is not a normal part of your day-to-day -day as assigning penalties to people and trying to follow up with them. Um, again, it mainly could be used as a strategy or a tactic when you have routine late filers um, or have someone who's not filing at all. Um, it is important to remember that no activity reports are still required and that, as I like to say, it's just as, as important to know if someone's not being financially active at all as if they're spending thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, it's just as interesting to the public if a committee forms and says they're going to do something and then isn't being financially active. So regardless of, you know, you're probably going to hear a lot of committees say, well, I don't need to report because I didn't do anything this time, right? You're going to hear that a lot. We hear that a lot from people who should know better. So you're definitely going to hear that. Um, and just, you know, that's, I, I think a good line to give them is it's just as important for the public to know if you're not spending anything, um, you know, as if you are, it's both, they're just important. There's still a deadline and it does increase their violation percentage for the next time. If you choose to do enforcement, um, again, we're happy to help you with enforcement, um, and we're happy to help talk with you if you have someone who is continually not filing on time or not filing at all. Um, any questions at this time about any of that? We assessed a penalty and the matter was appealed to the commission. The commission lowered the penalty, but we were informed that it was owed to the ethics commission, not the municipality. Is this still the case? What is the motivation for a municipality to begin an enforcement or penalty process if the fees are not recoverable at the local level? Hi, Angela. Good question. So, yes, I remember this coming up. And part of it just has to do with how statute is worded um, and how the process is, is that if a penalty is assigned by the commission, such as in the case, what happened with you is the person requested a waiver. So it was the commission who decided upon the waiver. The penalty belongs to the state level to the commission. Um, so part of it would be if someone doesn't request a waiver and just owes the municipality, then the municipality would keep the funds. Um, but I do understand it puts you in a difficult position if you have, you may not, you may be reluctant to assign penalties if someone's going to request a waiver and it belongs to the commission. However, we also feel this is more than a funding or monetary issue and more about, you know, making sure that there is a deterrent effect and that future committees understand that there may be a financial penalty in the future for anything they do. Um, you know, that's the deterrent effect we find to be important, but we also understand, you know, that the municipality is doing a lot of work and doesn't get the penalty funds back. Let's take another question. Ask it. What statute outlines the penalty and fines? Uh, so that is under um, Chapter 13, under 21A, it's the statute formula itself is 1020, the Section 1020A in Chapter 13 under Title 21A. And Angela is asking, just to be clear, if the person requests a waiver, the commission determines the lower, and the commission determines the lower amount, it is entitled to the amount. Yeah, we don't have another way to process it at this time. Um, so moving forward, unless there are any other questions about that. And again, um, if you have specific case-by-case -case questions, also you're welcome to email me. Um, I'll state my contact information at the end of my spiel. Um, 
and we'll go and I'm happy to take case by case questions as well and talk to you about those. Um, so the next part I wanted to discuss is disclosure statements on communications. So this is moving away from registration and reporting um, and into communications and what committees are required to put on communications as part of disclosure. Um, so just to wrap up, does anyone have questions about reporting and registration before I move on to a different topic? Just a second, right? Jeff, do you think is it time? not seeing any pop up cool all right so disclosure statements are incredibly important those are the statements on any piece of direct mail on lawn signs on digital ads on radio ads that tell the public who financed and who authorized the activity so this is an area where we can get a lot of complaints concerns just general calls just general calls about being upset. So and this is obviously going to take up some of your time as well. I think I hear from a number of clerks, the candidate registrars do too, about committees, groups, candidates in their municipality who are putting out signs, who are putting out mailers, it may not have the correct disclosure, and then everyone gets up at arms. So it's important to know what their requirements are. So ballot question committees, to start with, their disclosure statements are a bit different and they're a little less detailed because they are not influencing candidate elections. So ballot question committees are a little more simple in that anytime $500 or more is spent on any direct communication, the communication must state who paid for the communication and the address of it. So you know, if it was, for instance, ABC, BQC, putting out direct mailers, that pretty much all direct mailers are going to cost more than $500. Uh, the disclosure statement must read, you know, paid for by the ABC, BQC, and then state their address. Um, it's pretty simple and straightforward. For PACs, they are required to have more disclosure statements because they are ostensibly clearly identifying at least one candidate in their communications. And it's very important for the public to understand that these communications do not come from any candidate, whether it's the candidate being supported, whether it's the candidate's opponent, whether there's some kind of defeats language going on. Um, so disclosure statements from PACs that name a clearly identified, that name or depict a clearly identified candidate must include the language not authorized by any candidate on it. That's to make very clear that candidates were not involved. Um, it's also exceptionally important that candidates actually were not involved. Um, that's a whole other can of worms that if you have collaboration, cooperation between a candidate and a committee, I don't want to get too much into that today because like I said, that's, uh, that's a can of worms, uh, but happy to talk to you about that individually if you have any concerns about what's happening in your community. Obviously, we're talking about in Maine, no matter the size, it's a small town. And most people know a lot of other people, especially the politically involved folks. So there are some things we can guide about how to be careful to avoid such collaboration or cooperation, um, but won't get specifically too into that today. Uh, PACs are also required to state who paid for an ad. So PACs do have much longer at times disclosure statements on direct communication. So they have to say who it was paid for by the address of the uh, committee, and then also not authorized by any candidate as well. Um, the guidebooks we have out include example disclosure statements. The municipal guide I'm putting out soon for ballot question committees will have example disclosure statements um depending on the type of communication there can be exceptions to how a communication uh how a disclosure statement is written um there are exemptions for really small items um you know like lapel stickers are one that come up a lot um, there's just no way to fit disclosure statements on those buttons um other kind of promotional materials like pens or Sometimes people do like USB memory sticks. Those types of things are too small. But for the most part on your general type of communications, 
um, direct mailers, lawn signs. Julie, could you please close that door? Thank you. Uh, so communications like lawn signs, direct mail, online advertisements, social media advertisements, um, all of those require a full disclosure statement. Um, I'm not going to go into television ads. I'm assuming most municipalities are not having television ads. If you do, you can call me and we can go over it. Um, but I'm going to assume that that's not happening. Um, any communication put out by PACS that is an independent expenditure also has to include a other fun little statement called the top funders or top three funders statement. So when any kind of group, particularly a PAC, puts out a communication that is considered an independent expenditure, they have to list who their top three funders are in the disclosure statement. Um, that is something that can also be a bit more complicated. There's a number of rules to help people figure out who those top three funders are. Happy to go over that with you at another time if that's necessary, but it is up to the PACs to determine who their top three funders essentially in the last year are and list those funders on their communications. You want to take a pause for a second and see if any questions have come in about disclosure and statements. Okay. All right, doesn't appear to be in case. Lovely. Um, so when it comes to, we're going to talk about terminating a committee, which is, you know, everyone's favorite because then they stop bugging you and stop reporting with you. Uh, so when a committee wants to be done reporting, they have to have a $0 balance on their reports. Now, we understand in real life that may be slightly hard to get to exactly zero. I'm personally okay if they have pretty small amounts, like under $100, letting them terminate, um, especially where people are filing on paper. Um, you know, simple math errors are possible. Um, you know, writing in a number slightly wrong is possible. Um, if you have concerns or questions about what a committee's balance is and they would like to terminate, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, it should be noted on a committee's last report if they're planning on this being their last report and at that point they're reporting responsibilities with you and um, we do not necessarily require a specific termination statement though considering they file on paper versus e-filing with us we actually have a way to flip their flag basically from active to terminated it wouldn't be a terrible idea especially if it's been a more active pack it has a, had a lot of money or bqc has a lot of money moving in and out of it to have some kind of email or simple statement from them coming in saying that you know the committee is done being financially active um and would like to and would like to terminate and again that that ends reporting responsibilities and if they wanted to become financially active again they would need to register as a different group um that is most of my content um at the time um i want to see if any other questions have come in about any of this while i have been going over all of this detail doesn't appear so so i just wanted to reiterate as well and i hope most of you know this that both myself and the candidate registrars are always here to help you. Um, we don't expect you to remember verbatim everything we've said. We also know that there's, um, especially at the municipal level, people like to come up with all sorts of crazy questions and weird things to do that you don't have a clear answer for, and we're always happy to help. Um, so again, I'm your go-to person for committees, for political action committees and ballot question committees. Um, if, and, um, Julie, I don't know if you want to put it, if you could put my email address and direct number in the chat. I'll say them out loud now, but Julie will put them in the chat as well. Um, so my email address is just emma.burke.burke at maine.gov. And my direct line um, is 287-4709. Um, so again, happy to help answer any questions you have. Obviously, our goal is to keep people from being... Um, delinquent and reporting or registration and trying to make sure all the folks in your municipality are, you know, everything is being disclosed to them. They have access to the registration and reports of committees. 
um, that are, you know, helping try to influence their vote. Um, we're interested, we may be seeing an uptick in municipal ballot question committees as different things come in. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are aware, there's been um, a big push to um, start doing broadband type internet and forcing municipalities to vote on broadband internet type issues. Um, this has started coming up. Um, and again, political action committees or anything to do with candidates and influencing, trying to influence the support or defeat of one or groups of candidates. Um, so I'm your girl for all of that. I'm happy to help you. Hopefully I ran through the questions you had today about trying to get reporting schedules down and content and reports in and disclosure statements on communications. Um, just a quick note that all lawn signs you require different disclosure statements um, from the Department of Transportation. Um, we can't really answer as to what those requirements are. Um, and that's also more in your public works department. Um, so it might be good to reach out to you know public works and make sure they're up to date on the DOT requirements on signs because we hear a lot about those too. Um, so I think we're going to take a small break, probably five to 10 minutes or so, five minutes. Um, we'll mute on our end and you guys can go take a potty break or a drink break, whatever you need. And then we'll be back with Lori and Aaron. Ready? Everybody, hello. I'm uh, Aaron Gordon, a candidate registrar. Lori Brand on the other candidate registrar. Uh, depending on which half of the state you live in, you'll get uh, shuffled to one or the other of us. But of course, we can always answer any candidate questions that you might have. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about now. I'm going to go over the candidate filing requirements. I'm going to try and keep it as simple and quick as possible. Uh, so I'm going to ask that you uh, hold on to questions until the end, unless you're having technical trouble, in which case, of course, let us know. Um, and we'll just, we'll dive in. So candidates for municipal elections are required to register with you um, within 10 days of becoming financially active is the law, but really we encourage candidates to register as soon as they know they are running. Um, candidates are, required to report their financial activity, but if a candidate has absolutely no intention of being financially active, if they intend, if they're not going to spend any money, they're not going to raise any money, they're not even going to use their own money, they can file for a reporting exemption, and there's a, a, a portion on the registration form, the very end of the registration form has a place where they can declare that they will be uh, they will not be financially active. They're requesting a reporting exemption. They have to sign that. They have to get it notarized, and they would have to turn that into you. If that person then later decides to become financially active, they have to uh, have that exemption revoked before they can become financially active. So in general, candidates are going to be filing reports with you. Candidates are required to file the 11-day pre-election report as well as the 42-day post-election report. 
uh, unless your municipality has additional reports in your schedule, in which case that's something that we would address when we send out our packet at the beginning of the year. Candidates uh, are also required to file 24 hour reports in the last 13 days before the election if they have a single um, ex a single contribution or expenditure of a thousand dollars or more. Um, and then post election, if a candidate still has funds remaining, they're required to keep reporting semi annually. So generally, that's going to be either the July semi annual or the well, usually it's just the January semi annual, uh, depending on when your election is, and then July semi annual. Candidates are required to keep reporting until they have less than one hundred dollars, at which point they can be terminated, they can be all done. They have to get rid of all of their surplus campaign funds within four years. Um, hopefully that's not too much trouble for municipal candidates. Contributions, um, a candidate can spend as much of their own money on their campaign as they want to. Uh, there's no limit to how much a candidate or their spouse or domestic partner can contribute to their own campaign. That activity does need to be reported. Um, but they're not subject to the contribution limits that everyone else uh, is. The contribution for municipal candidates as of January this year is $575. Uh, and that's the limit for individual contributions, for contributions from committees, for contributions from businesses, etc. Candidates have to report, so they should be keeping a record of all of their contributions and contributor information on the campaign level. And when it comes to reporting, what they have to report to you is uh, the name and address of any contributor giving more than $10, as well as the employer and occupation information for any contributor giving over $50. Candidates can, uh, if they have a lot of small dollar con contributions, um, report contributions of, less, of $50 or less in the aggregate. And there's a little description on the paper report form that we give you of that uh, so they can refer to that. Uh, they are also required to report not just their monetary contributions, but also their in-kind contributions. An in-kind contribution is subject to all of the same um, reporting requirements as a monetary contribution, but it's a contribution of goods or services. So let's say they have uh, a neighbor who uh, wants to make lots of t-shirts for them. That neighbor can, can donate the t-shirts uh, to the campaign up to the contribution limit um, as long as the candidate reports that. Candidates are required to report all of their expenditures, all their campaign activity, everything they spend their campaign funds on and expenditure should be campaign related it should be obvious uh when you're looking at a report uh that it was for a campaign purpose um and uh they need to have a record of the uh, vendor's name and address uh, and provide a description of that expenditure on the report Candidates are also required to put disclosure statements on their signs, their mailers, um, basically any piece of literature or flair that the campaign produces um, has to have a disclosure statement on it. The candidate version of this is very simple. It just needs to say paid for and authorized by the candidate. Uh, if they're, you know, if the item that they're printing is very small, uh, you don't have to put a disclosure statement on it. Uh, and, and you can certainly, we occasionally get questions about that. Use your best judgment. Um, you know, maybe a standard bumper sticker isn't too small. Maybe the printer they're using can't print something tiny enough that it would fit. So, you know, that's, that can be case by case if it comes up. Uh, and that's my that's my very simple uh, outline of candidate requirements. Uh, of course, um, candidates are also subject to late filing penalties. 
And uh, if you find that uh, the candidates are continually uh, turning their reports in late, uh, this is something that as Emma discussed uh, in her presentation, you can use as an you know as a, an enforcement tool, a sort of encouragement to file on time. Candidate penalties are also calculated according to uh, the percentage of activity multiplied by the number of days they are late. Uh, and when you run into thorny problems, you can reach out to us uh, for assistance. So I'm going to open it up to questions. Lori, do you have anything to add as folks assemble their thoughts? No. Great. No questions? Are there any general questions? We do have, uh, if anyone has general questions uh, for the role uh, we play uh, with your um, offices, that's that's helpful too. Is there a penalty for filing a candidate registration late? Uh, there can be, yes. Uh, so we have, with uh, state candidates in the past, we have occasionally assessed a $50 penalty for not filing a registration on time. That's really when um, the the sort of 10-day statutory requirement um, to register comes in because you can determine, you know, how late you thought the registration was and how severe a violation it is that they didn't get registered. Um, that can come up. If a candidate isn't financially active um, and you don't know about them until they submit the paperwork they need to be on the ballot, um, you know, they can fly under the radar until that point. But really, if they continue to not register once they have qualified for the ballot uh, and you know that they are financially active because you're seeing signs or people are talking about mailers or whatever, um, then at that point you can you can start to exercise that um, that penalty process if you need to. For reporting of fifty dollars or more, they must report a donor's occupation and what else? So their uh, name, address, employer, and occupation information. That said, it is the candidate's responsibility to ask for employer and occupation. It is the contributor's right to say none of your beeswax. And then they can just check a box that says that they've requested the information. The name and address is non-negotiable. The employer and occupation, if an ordinary neighbor doesn't want to tell them, that's fine. Candidates also should be aware that just because a donor gives them $10 one day and say 25 in another day, when they go over that amount, they have got to now itemize that contributor. So it's very important that they keep track of who is donating to them. That's a good point, Lori. We did release a new version of the Municipal Candidates Guidebook. So hopefully you've all had a chance um, to at least know where to find this if you need it. Um, we really tried to make things as straightforward as possible in this new edition. Um, Lori did a great job putting step-by-step -step instructions for candidates on how to complete their reports. Um, so hopefully that's going to answer a lot of questions for folks. And if not, of course, um, they'll reach out to you. And if you can't answer it, you can reach out to us. If we don't have any more questions, then I guess we're good. We can wrap it up. Yep. Duly put our contact information in already. Uh, so again, any questions that you have about campaign finance reporting for candidates, reach out to Lori and I. Um, you can call the main line and Julie will direct you appropriately as well. And uh, you know, we're here to help. We know again, this is not your primary focus. Uh, so if you have questions, please let us know. Have a great day. Yeah, have a great one, everyone.
Thanks so much.